After Darwin, the next most important thing that happened in the world of evolutionary biology was the discovery of genetics. So let's first talk about different mechanisms in of inheritance and how people thought traits were passed down from parent to offspring. Now we're going to talk about genetics, specifically Mendelian genetics. For this lecture, we're first going to talk about mechanisms of inheritance, then the emergence of genetics and how it was discovered, and lastly, Mendel's laws and what we can draw from them. But first, let's talk about genetics and what this field actually means. Genetics just means that it's the study of heredity. We're looking at the variations of characteristics in one generation and how they're passed down to the next. So you spend a lot of time looking at parents and their offspring and the similarities between them because we're trying to figure out how those traits are passed down. Today, genetics is pretty much synonymous with DNA, but DNA was only discovered in the 1950s and genetics has actually been around for much longer. So remember that whenever you're thinking of genetics, heredity is a much broader term than just DNA. Early, um, before we discovered DNA and knew exactly what was going on, people would study heredity through a different, couple different ways. Um, you might map traits. So you would draw a pedigree, a specific type of family tree, and literally map the, the traits and how they were passed from one generation to the next. People were trying to discover what type of trait it was. When um, technology got a little bit better, you might look at blood proteins. Um, so looking at blood types or other proteins that you can um, get from your blood and see how they differ from one person to the next. And of course, DNA analysis, which is common today, especially with the proliferation of all of those uh, direct-to-consumer genetic testing companies, which you probably shouldn't do. That's another topic, but don't. Um, for an example, here is a pedigree. Um, by convention, males are square, <laughs> females are circles. Um, don't read too much into that. Um, and what we do is, you know, we draw a line between people who are married and their children are below. So in this pedigree, we have three different generations. So we have the grandparents on top. They have one, uh, one, two, three children. Two of those children are married. And then we have one grandchild. If they are colored in, that means they have a trait. So they're displaying a specific phenotype. Normally, when we do these types of pedigrees, we're looking for like a genetic disease such as hemophilia. Um, and then once you look at the pattern of who has the trait, you can infer people who are carriers. So you can see one of our males here, only half of it is shaded in. So that means he only has one allele rather than two. We'll get to some of those terms in a little bit. Um, but let's talk about some of these mechanisms of inheritance. The reasons we're talking about this is, remember, when we talked about natural selection, one of the important parts and the conditions for natural selection to even happen in the first place was heredity. Heritable traits, the ability to reliably pass on a trait from one generation to the next, is a prerequisite for natural selection to happen. Um, for all evolution to happen, really, because if you cannot reliably pass on traits from one generation to the next, the natural world would look completely different because we wouldn't have this consistency between generations. Um, and inheritance, you know, everybody recognizes that. Children in general look like their parents. Siblings tend to look similar. But for a long time, nobody knew how it happened. We just knew that it happened. So, of course, this led to people come up with a couple different theories for how they thought it happened. One of the first ones was called preformationism, that there was this little tiny homunculus or a tiny little person all wrapped up in the sperm, um, and that would eventually develop into a full, fully formed person. We don't believe that anymore. <laughs> um, the one we do think happens is called epigenesis. So a person develops from a fertilized egg. So it's half the material from the father and half the material from the mother. But even though now we understand epigenesis, we're getting half and half material from both parents, that still doesn't tell us exactly how that inheritance or that genetic material is passed on. One of the predominant theories, um, and this is what Darwin believed, was called blending inheritance. Let's look at an example. So here we have a bunch of cows. Very exciting, I know. All of these cows are dark. Then we introduce a single white cow. And in the next generation, now we have a few cows that are kind of in the middle. 
because the generation has passed that one white cow has interbred with the others and now we have a couple that are halfway in between and eventually with more and more generations we're going to start to have a population that's slightly lighter because we have introduced a single white cow to this population and you can see it's just like this mathematical average it's gradually evens out and now we have lighter lighter colored cows here but because we only introduced a single one not that much lighter in general, this makes sense to most people and I can understand why, but we're really zooming out and we're looking at genetics in a very macro level. And if we really zoom in, it happens a little differently, but more on that next time. So can you explain? What does the field of genetics study?